Hey everyone, my name is Michael Seiger and I'm the founder and publisher of i6sigma.com, the largest community of lean and Six Sigma professionals in the world and the resource for learning to drive breakthrough improvement. Here's what we do here. We bring on successful lean and Six Sigma business leaders. We learn from their experiences. They share their strategies and tactics. And then when you have a success to share, you can come on the show and give back as today's guest is going to do. Anyone that visits my garage knows that I love tools. My father was an automotive mechanic, so I have every screwdriver of every size, every hammer type, every wrench, you name it, I have it in my toolbox. So whenever a job comes my way, I know I have the right tools to get it done. Just like I wouldn't use a small slotted screwdriver to take out a Phillips screw, I cringe at the idea of doing one factor at a time testing or best guess and then test to figure out the best solution to a problem that I'm facing. The same is true in business, yet it happens every day. If I read the latest technology startup blogs, they actively promote one factor at a time testing or A-B testing. There has got to be a better way, and there is. Joining me today to help us understand DOE, or Design of Experiments, is Dr. Mark Kimley, President and Co-Founder of Air Academy Associates. Mark has more than 30 years of teaching and consulting experience and has trained, consulted, and mentored more than 25,000 people from more than 20 countries, including people at Sony, Microsoft, GE, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and Samsung. He's also co-authored or edited five plus books, including one that I was honored to have helped publish through I6 Sigma's parent company, CTQ Media, Design for Six Sigma, The Tool Guide for Practitioners. And we're going to talk a little bit about this book today. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a real pleasure to be with you. We're going to tackle the topic of DOE in two parts, Mark, as we discussed. The first part will we'll be a conversation between you and me about design of experiments so we can understand the concept and put everything into context. So somebody who's never done design of experiments but has heard of A-B testing can understand why they're related, how they're different. And then we'll move into um, sort of a phase two, which is a hands-on portion, and we'll run a couple of examples, one transactional, one more technical so that the audience can see exactly how design of experiments are run. Sound good, Mark? Sounds great, Mike. All right. So let's start with an easy question, Mark. What is design of experiments? Mike, let me uh, give you my elevator speech for DOE or design of experiments. Um, DOE is the best data collection strategy that's out there today when our goal is to investigate relationships between inputs and outputs of a process. Now, let me explain inputs and outputs of a process. A process that most of us are very familiar with, Mike, is driving an automobile or owning an automobile. And one of the performance measures or responses that we might be interested is gas mileage, miles per gallon. That's how we typically measure gas mileage. Now, there's other measures of performance or responses, like how, how long does it take to go from zero to 60 miles per hour? Uh, but let me just talk about miles per gallon a second. Uh, that would be considered an output of the process, uh, of this automobile process, if we want to call it. It's a performance measure. Sometimes we call it a response variable. It's also an output. Now, we can surmise what various inputs might be to that, that affect that output. Well, one might be, and our experience level with an automobile is going to tell us that. And uh, one might be, Tire pressure, you know, maybe we want to, tire pressure would be the factor. Now, if we tested it at two different levels, uh, like uh, 25 PSI versus 35 PSI, tire pressure would be the factor, and the two levels at which we tested would be, say, 25 and 35 PSI. Another factor that we could surmise might affect gas mileage is the type of uh, fuel that we're using. Is it 85 octane, 91 octane? So fuel type might be another factor. The two settings or the two levels that we might want to test uh, fuel type at are maybe 
I know in Colorado we have 85 octane. You may not have that in Washington, but we may go to a low setting like 85 octane and a high setting of 91. So that gives the uh, the uh, uh, the followers here a little bit of an idea of what a factor is and what a uh, uh, or an input. Sometimes we call these factors inputs and outputs. But by and large, DOE is the best way to collect data when you want to find relationships between inputs and outputs, Mike. Okay, that makes sense. And if I was an automobile manufacturer and I realized how important that miles per gallon rating was of the cars I was manufacturing with gases, you know, uh, gas prices nearing five dollars uh, a gallon here in Washington state. Um, I know that that's likely one of the top um, factors influencing whether somebody buys their car or buys some other car. So I need to optimize my miles per gallon on that car. And, and I want to produce the best miles per gallon possible. So what are the factors that go in there? Clearly, I need to have something that's, uh, uh, that's um, uh, energy efficient. Um, but there's a million different, fa- or there's a lot of different factors that go in besides just the engine. It's the tire pressure, and it's, you know, exactly what you said earlier. Um, and so that's what DOE allows you to do. Optimize an output variable based on a bunch of different input factors. Exactly. Okay. And so why is DOE so important to regular business people or to other people? You know, I understand how it works in in a manufacturing environment, and that's where I think DOE has the most classic examples. Why is it important to to regular people uh, or regular business users? Well, it's important to everyone, whether they're a business leader or practitioner or whatever, because first of all, it's going to save time and money. And time and money are our, are great resources for us. So if you can save time and money, that's that's a, a very important part of it. Uh, you know, test and evaluation is in almost every organization. Mike does testing. You test something, whether it's a product, a service, uh, whatever it is. You're testing a lot of the time, mm-hmm. and and a lot of folks don't know that DOE is the connectivity between test and evaluation. How you test how you collect the data, what combinations you test of the different factors of the different levels is going to either make it easy or make it hard in the evaluation stage. So DOE is the connecting link between test and evaluation. And uh, But besides time and money, uh, a big thing is knowledge. Uh, uh, you know, knowledge is critical. DOE is going to give the practitioner, the leader, the knowledge that that they need. Uh, what's important? Can you separate out? Is gas for gas mileage? Is it tire pressure that's more important than the fuel type? How do you prioritize? How do you rank order the factors that could affect? Which ones are significant? Which ones are not? Knowing that kind of knowledge, of course, leads downstream to cost and time savings as well. But interaction effects, DOE is designed to get at interaction effects. Interaction effects are tough stuff. Uh, Tolstoy once said, and let me quote uh, Tolstoy on this, he said, the combination of events is beyond the comprehension of man. Well, guess what combination of events are called in DOE? They're called interaction effects. Okay. I'd like to uh, extend Tolstoy's quote to the combination of events is not beyond the comprehension of man using DOE. So DOE allows us to get the requisite knowledge we need to make good decisions. I mean, that's basically what it is. It's it's changing, I think, to I know. Yeah. And uh, the more knowledge we have, the better decisions we'll make. And the better decisions we make, the more money and and time we'll save. Hey, Mark, in in our pre-interview conversation, we uh, discussed interaction effects on DOE, which we're going to go into more. Um, later on. So if people are like, well, I don't understand interaction effects, um, taking it to the off, um, off statistical world example, the, the combination effects from Tolstoy, you used a real world example of um, uh, uh, weather, uh, weather issues that happened as a result of combination effects that, that helped me understand interaction effects. Can you repeat that? Well, uh, I'm not sure I used the weather one, but uh, weather is, is an important factor, and that's something we typically can't control. It's a noise variable, but weather interacts with a lot of factors. For example, in the gas mileage, uh, 
you take a look at uh, miles per gallon, mm -hmm. uh, the effect of weather combined with altitude, for example. I live at 6,000 feet. Okay, yesterday we had uh, what might one, one might call a, a blizzard. Okay, so, so the weather, if I were driving yesterday, even at this altitude, the change in weather coupled with the altitude uh, could uh, give me a, a, a gross change in the, the gas mileage that I'm expecting. Basically, if one factor, like weather, altitude is another factor, when the effect of one factor is exacerbated by the, the change in another factor, that's when we have an interaction effect. Got it. Okay. Um, so in my intro, I measured that a lot of companies in the startup world were focused on A-B testing. Uh, there, 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 there's a whole slew of service providers online like Optimizely.com or Visual Website Optimizer.com. Even Google Analytics allows companies to do A-B testing. So if I have a sign-up page on i6sigma.com, for example, I can test how many people come to the page uh, and click and sign up with a green button versus an orange button on the side. Um, so that's A-B testing or one factor at a time testing. You know, I change one factor and I measure it. What makes DOE different from these other testing techniques like one factor at a time or educated guess guesses or A-B testing? That's a, a great question, Mike, because that's the heart and soul of DOE. Why, why would I want to use a DOE when I was taught in high school to do one factor at a time testing? When my chemistry teacher says, when you want to see the effect of, of temperature on this uh, experiment, right. you got to hold everything else the same and you just change that one thing. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see what effect it has on your, your yield or whatever you're measuring for a response or an output. How misinformed are we? because we're teaching people at the very young stages of their life uh, to do this A-B or one factor at a time testing. Um, and uh, you know, there's other, there's, there's different criteria or what I should say attributes of DOE like replication, randomization, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we get into the examples. But the one, the one characteristic of DOE that it, it distinguishes it from everything else is the concept of orthogonality. Orthogonality allows, and that's how we distinguish DOE. A DOE is a testing technique that has an orthogonal design or nearly orthogonal design. Now, what orthogonality buys us is the ability to evaluate these factors, their effects and the interactions, independently from one another. That key word is independent evaluation. And what does independent evaluation buy us? Well, independent evaluation buys us the ability to get to root cause, that is cause and effect relationships. And cause and effect relationships, root cause analysis today is tough stuff, Mike. People make light of it. It is hard because of those doggone combination effects, right, those right. interaction effects. So if you have orthogonal designs, orthogonality buys you the ability to evaluate the effects independently. Independence allows you to buy the ability to get to root cause analysis. And of course, if you can find root causes of problems, guess what? Your decision making is enhanced. And of course, the financial uh, you know, aspect will also be enhanced. So that's, that's uh, the orthogonality aspect. Okay. And so that all makes sense to me, Mark. You know, I, I, I think most of the people that watch the show are educated like you and I are, and they can understand that you're saying orthogonality is this concept that allows you to evaluate the factors independently so you don't see the bias you you don't have results that are confounded is another word that like That's you right. know means that the results you're seeing are actually affected by something else that you're not anticipating so that makes sense but then i just go back to my to my real world example where i've got a sign up page on i6sigma.com and i want to uh, you know, the output variable, variable from what you were telling me earlier was I want people to actually sign up. Maybe it's put in an email address and click the, um, the sign up button, right? And so A-B testing would tell me or, or you know, my, my fifth grade science teacher would tell me start off with an orange button, change it to a green button, see how much that affects it. 
uh, then go from whichever one's better. That's new. Your, now your base. Now change it from a green button with um, a sans serif font to a, a sans font. Uh, and so it feels more like a typewriter. Maybe that will affect people. And, you know, every industry and every group of people is different. And you might say that the business, uh, you know, the, the Fortune 100, which come to visit i6sigma.com to learn about concepts like DOE would be more attuned to a, a font that looks like a typewriter, let's say. And so they're going to get a higher click-through rate on that. Will DOE allow me to say my output is signups on this page? Now I want to look at all the factors that are involved and just solve it once so I'm not doing A-B testing for the rest of my life? Abs absolutely, Mike. That's the beauty and the power of DOE. You can test multiple things simultaneously and still evaluate the effects independently. Orthogonality means balance in the design. That is, get back to your font and your color thing. You, you now home in on either orange or green and then you start changing the fonts. There's a way to test those simultaneously so that you have balance in the design and that balance will allow you to get that independent evaluation. We'll talk a little bit about that in one of the examples that we do. Great. All right. Because all of our designs, all of our DOEs, all of our testing strategies are going to be orthogonal or nearly orthogonal. Okay. So my, so my next question was going to be, you know, when, when we talk about designing a car for optimum miles per gallon or doing a design of experiments on a missile system, for example, uh, my question is, is DOE only applicable to complex and expensive systems such as manufacturing environments or product design or, or is it valuable for somebody like me who can change a web page myself and and the cost is basically zero to make all those changes that's one of the myths about doe mike and you kind of hit on it there saying well it's only for complex situations complex products services and that doe can be used in any area of life uh for example i go to my you know, for shoulder therapy, go to my physical therapist and I ask him, I said, okay, I've only got time today uh, in a day to do four or five exercises and you got to tell me what those four or five best ones are. And not only that, you got to tell me the order in which I'm supposed to do them because obviously order might make a difference too. Right. And this young man, good, good young guy, he looked at me and said, man, this guy must be out of his mind. And, and I said, you know, we can help you with this. Just look out in the waiting room how many patients you have. Are you doing any testing? Are you recording any data? And we can show you how to collect that data to help you. So I don't care, Mike, if it's in the, the orthopedic, uh, you know, uh, therapy room, whether it's in finance, whether it's education. In education, I mean, I remember the days at the Air Force Academy where we would sit around the table and say, some people will say, well, well we got to quiz daily. We, we got to give daily quizzing. That helps the learning. And somebody else will say, that doesn't, that doesn't do anything. Daily quizzing doesn't help anything. How are you going to answer that question? You got to test it. Okay, same thing with computer-based learning. You've got those advocates of it. You got the advocates that, uh, that don't espouse to computer-based learning. You got to test it. I don't care, Mike, if it's education, if it's finance. Uh, if it's uh, sales and marketing, we'll get into a little bit of that later. But find if your budget for sales or for marketing is a certain level, how do you break that budget up into the various categories where you can spend your advertising dollars? What is the optimal mix? It can be used for anything. It can be used for any time you want to find what factors are the most important that affect some response or some value uh, variable that's an output. This is the way to do it. Yeah. All right. It, it doesn't have to be hard. You can do it for one factor, two factors, multiple factors. DOE is sometimes called multivariate testing mm -hmm. because the beauty of it is you can test many things simultaneously. Yeah. And so in, in part two of this interview, Mark, we're going to go over an example from healthcare and we're going to go over an example which is really technical, and then we're going to go over an example that uh, from a transactional environment, as you just alluded to, in sales, um, to to show exactly how those design of experiments are completed. Um, and we talked briefly about um, you know my application in the high tech world. You know, companies that are growing completely online, like an Amazon.com or an eBay.com or a Google.com. How did they? 
do their testing? How do they sell more? How do they make sure that you know the ads that are placed at the top are being clicked at to the highest degree? That can be done with design of experiments as we just discussed. Can you give me an example, a DOE example from government use? Well, I could give you hundreds of those, Mike, uh, that involve ships, large systems like ships, subs, aircraft, uh, uh, ground vehicles, uh, and also systems that are now being designed to prevent successful cyber attacks. Mm. I'll give you those, but uh, the one I want to give you is one that I think we can all relate to, and that's AIDS. Um, the spread of AIDS has been a big problem, and the State Department years ago asked us at the Air Force Academy to investigate the key factors that uh, influenced uh, many, many response variables, one of which is the propagation of AIDS. And uh, uh, so it's a, it's a big problem, uh, lots of factors uh, that are involved. And they had a model that was built by scientists at Los Alamos National Labs and also Miriam, uh, the Miriam uh, Research Center at University of Illinois. And they had like 360 uh, D differential equations. They're deterministic differential equations that had different outputs, different inputs, and somehow we had to make sense of all of that. Mm -hmm. So we got it down to 134 factors, about 130 factors that wa we wanted to investigate. Well, what kind of design do you do you have for evaluating 134 factors simultaneously? Well, we had to. Today it would be easy because we have the software the hardware to do this. But back in those days, Mike, we didn't have that, so we had to generate a 136 design, which is called a Plaquette Burma design, doesn't matter what you call it, but it, it's 136 test cases, or runs, as we would call them. And we did that, and we were able to flesh out the most important factors. That was a screening design, where you screen out or separate out the vital few from the trivial many. So that was a, one of the largest designed experiments I was involved in, you know, some years ago. Now with the design of, of uh, new automobiles and things like that, you're, you're dealing with lots of factors like that again. Simulators uh, have lots of factors. And that, that was essentially what this was. It was a simulator, but they were differential equations, very complex stuff. And you had to ferret out the most important factors. And it was interesting that the, the State Department folks that, uh, you know, uh, heard the last briefing and the and got the reports that it's really interesting now that we can prioritize these factors and we can now start looking at what we have to act on where do, where do we spend the money now to in fact uh, reduce this propagation of AIDS. Gotcha. So so that sounds like a great example. Something that's very complex from a uh, socio economic perspective. Um, 130 factors that seems. That's the kind of thing that would boggle my mind to try and solve. How do you solve AIDS? But you you used a bunch of experts. You narrowed it down to 130 factors. You then put it into a design of experiments using a specific design that you mentioned. And you screened it to find which factors were actually important to the output and which factors, you know, actually weren't that important. Maybe there was some personal bias from a PhD who's in expert in some area of age or, or society and uh, and you were actually able to use the data to then find the truth. Um, and what happened from that study, Mark? Is there is there well, something that's that was measurable that was that the government was able to use in order to um, affect the, the spread of AIDS? Absolutely. I can't remember the top seven, but once we got the top seven or so, we were able to then build modeling designs, Mike. That would allow us to get at the interaction effects because that's where the keys are. The keys are in those doggone combination effects or interaction effects that you have. And by golly, we could then, in fact, find some interaction effects. And that led the government to say, ooh, well, this factor by itself is not as important as the other factor. But when you combine them together, their combined effect is much greater than each one individually. Yeah. So uh, that allows them to uh, to home in on the factors, and then of course, like you say, the socioeconomic impact uh, is huge, and uh, you've got to zero in on what can you do from a soci socioeconomic point of view to uh, minimize the impact of those factors. That's the real hard part. The DOE, Mike, isn't hard. <laughs> that that's the point. The point is is. We're, we're leaving that. We think the easy stuff is hard and the hard stuff is easy. 
The hard stuff is once you know the factors, now what are you going to do about it? Where are you going to put your money? How are you going to impact those factors? Right, definitely. You know, but somebody may be watching this interview right now, Mark, and say, well, I've worked in healthcare and I know that AIDS is a statistical issue and 130 factors. I just work in human resources or I just work in marketing at my company. Like you're talking about stuff that's rocket science. I, I am just a human resource manager. Can you give me an example from a functional area at a at a Fortune 100 company such as human resources or marketing where design of experiments can be applied? Absolutely. The one that comes to mind, Mike, comes from Boston Fleet Bank, which is now part of Bank of America. This was done, I think, 2004, maybe maybe eight, nine years ago, uh, done by a young lady and her team in the HR department at Boston Fleet Bank. Their problem was turnover. Turnover was the response. That's the variable that was creating problems. When you have high turnover rates, that's expensive. It costs mm -hmm. money to bring people in, to hire people, train them up to speed. And worse than that was uh, sometimes an unmeasurable thing like these, these folks were, the, the high turnover rate was in areas where these folks were inter interfacing with the customers, mm -hmm. okay? And that's, that's, that's tough stuff. So, right. uh, you know, I know DOE, but I, I'm not an HR person, but these guys know HR. So these guys said, said, what are the factors that could be contributing to these high turnover rates? Now, I probably wouldn't have come up with stuff like this, but... Um, Time since last promotion, you know, educational history. I might have, I might have gone to the educational history thing. Job stability history. Uh, what is the local unemployment rate at the time somebody left? What is the local employment alternatives? What's the company's market share? Then you've got uh, the company policies, like uh, what's the lateral upward mobility climate like, uh, the layoff climate. Uh, there are all kinds of factors. All of those things are factors. Well, guess what? They investigated 16 or 17 factors, and they narrowed them down to two or three that were really critical that allowed them to change their, their policies on supervision. Supervisor stability. That's not their mental stability. That's how long they were in grade. That, was, that turned out to be a very, very important factor. So it changed their policy uh, that supervisors would stay in their positions longer. They would have more training for their supervisors. And uh, one of the other factors was, that was important, statistically significant anyway, was how they recruited these people. Did they get them through an agency or were they hired based on internal recommendations? Mm -hmm. And uh, the internal recommendations, folks, they tended to stay longer. So those factors started coming out. Every time they had... And the beauty of the model that they developed was they got data. Every time there was somebody leave the company, they got data. So they knew what the factor values were at the time somebody left, and they could affiliate that with that particular individual. And they rolled that back into their model, continuously updating their model so they could predict and find what the factors, if there's any change in the factors that are really affecting the output. Yeah. So actually that example, Mike, was so... Uh, so impressive that it was written up in Harvard Business Review. So people can go to HBR and they can read about that particular DOE. Excellent. And, and uh, I'll, I'll put a link if I can find it to that HBR and if people want to buy it, if it has a cost or, or link. And if I forget, somebody from the audience post a comment and, and ask me to remember to post a link to that and I'll post a link. Um, but that, that's an enormous uh, uh, cost, employee turnover. You know, having worked at a large corporation, I know how much of my time goes into training somebody that I hire as well as the entire company. I think one time we quantified it at GE and it was at least $10,000 that goes into bringing on a new employee. And if you're at a startup company that maybe only has 10 employees, imagine how much money goes into – you know, setting up their computer system and getting them a desk and hooking up their phone system and changing it so that it says their name and, um, you know, everything, uh, setting them up with their 401k or, or benefits or whatever they have, like that's got to be at least a couple grand. So smart, stall, smart, sorry, small startups can't afford that. They need to make the right decision to begin with. And large corporations that are turning, that have a lot of employees, that could be an enormous cost per year, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. You know, I look right over here, right across Puget Sound at Amazon.com. 
they hire thousands of people every quarter because they're growing so fast. It, you know, increasing or decreasing their turnover rate from, I don't, and I'm just making up numbers, if it was 5% down to 2% or 1% would be an enormous benefit, let, uh, hard benefit, hard tangible benefit, let alone the soft benefits of like, oh, they brought in another underperformer that doesn't fit the job type that's going to leave in two months because they don't like this culture or whatever the factors are. I completely see how that would be a great uh, design of experiments to, to optimize. Yeah, just reading that article can give you give uh, HR departments ideas on how they can do this. And it uh, this was not a formal DOE. It was data collection that they orthogonalized the data after the fact, and they were able to home in on the key factors. Excellent. So, so this all sounds, you know, to, to somebody who is uninitiated to design of experiments, it seems like you need to be a mathematical genius or maybe a stats, a statistics expert to do DOE. Is that the case, Mark? Absolutely not. That's, that's another myth out there. I think people get uh, confused over the fact that design of experiments is kind of a fancy statistically related term that yeah. Yeah. blows people away. And uh, we live in 2013 now, Mike. Uh, you don't have to be a mathematical wizard. We have the software does the crunching for us. What does have to happen, the hardest part of DOE is this, Mike. It's the factors and the levels. And the folks that are in the discipline, whether it's HR, finance, IT, you gave uh, good IT examples from your own uh, business. It's the folks that are experienced in those areas that can determine what factors they should test, mm -hmm. like in the HR department. I would have never come up with, with the layoff climate or the upward lateral, mo lateral mobility factor within an organization. I, wouldn't, I would not have come up with that, but they did. So did they need you know, me to help them with that? No. The hardest part of DOE is coming up with the factors mm -hmm. and the levels. Once you know that, we can, uh, it, it's a piece of cake to set up the design. Now, randomization and replication, we have to talk about that too, but the orthogonality of the design, those designs are out there, Mike. We don't have to re reinvent the wheel. We right. can be a good driver of an automobile without having to invent the engine, so to speak. So we live in a society now and uh, we, we fully believe that the KISS approach, KISS means keep it simple statistically, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the approach you got to take with DOE because we've got high school folks doing DOEs at some of our clients. I mean, they don't have college degrees. These are high school graduates. They probably had a fairly good algebra background in high school, but they pick this stuff up like it, it's great. Uh, and you, you, we're not going to discriminate uh, amongst the mathematical background of people because you can be a good tester, a good experimenter using DOE without having a heavy-duty mathematical or statistical background. Yep. Now, I'm not saying that good education is not needed. I, I, you know, when you combine the, there's that combination effect. You combine process knowledge with education and the tools like you have in your garage, you will become a much better practitioner and you will make better decisions. And that's what this is all about. Great clarification, Mark. Okay, Mark, this part of the interview will be hands-on. You're sharing your screen right now. The audience can see that, uh, that you have a, um, a presentation document up. What's, what's our first design of experiment example going to be? Good, Mike. Uh, we have two case studies, as Mike said. The first one is going to be uh, where two companies merged and the, the director of sales from GlaxoSmithKline this is when Glaxo Welcome merged with uh, SmithKline Beecham. This is years ago. So now they have to combine their sales forces. And uh, this fellow had just taken the uh, Six Sigma DOE uh, portion of the black belt training. And he says, well, I could apply this concept of evaluating these factors independently and looking for interaction effects to combining my sales forces. So that's exactly what he did. He wanted to do, do a simple, obviously there's more than three factors that affect sales. But what I'm showing you on the screen right now is an IPO diagram standing for input process output. Mm -hmm. The output here is sales. Keep in mind that sales is measured in dollars and do more dollars is better. Bigger is better for the output. We just want to remember that so that when we get into the graphs, we remember that bigger numbers are better. Uh, and then the, the factors he wanted to evaluate are product types. He took two of the top product types they had 
And then, of course, the sales backgrounds are from the, each of the two different companies and the customer types. I'm not going to relate, but there's two different customer types. So the factors that he wanted to investigate uh, were product type, sales background, and customer type. And he's got two levels for each of those. And he wanted to uh, take a look at his sales force. And he had a lot of sales reps. So the beauty of the design I'm going to show you, which will turn out to be an eight-run full factorial design because you have two choices for product type, two choices for sales background, two choices for customer type. So the design I'm going to show you or generate for you or allow the software to generate for us is going to end up being a full factorial design, which will allow us to evaluate all of the interaction effects amongst those three, uh, as well as the main effects. Now, the beauty of this, he could have gotten this data, Mike, from uh, just historical data. But the point I want to make is that he randomized his sales reps to each of the eight combinations that I'm going to show you. So he had 16 sales reps for each of the combinations that I'm going to show you. So replicating, he's replicating the design 16 times. So he's getting data from 16 different sales reps for each of the eight combinations. So let's go into the software right now. And uh, let me just show you from scratch. I'm going to be using... Uh, let me use the sales data and sheet one here. I'm going to start from scratch to demonstrate this program that I call DOE Pro. DOE Pro is a very KISS approach to DOE. It allows a practitioner to come in and create a design uh, like uh, using computer aided. We use uh, let the computer select the design for us. The software will ask us how many levels do you want to test at? Well, the simplest is two levels. You got to test at least two levels. Uh, three level designs we won't get into today, but two levels. But we have three factors. There were three inputs on that IPO diagram. They were product type, they were sales background, and then customer type. So uh, we just press next, and then it comes up. If you want to let the software, uh, you want to put in the real life factors so you can say, oh, pro factor A is not A, but it's product type. So you type that in. You come over and give it the two levels, the low and the high setting, mm -hmm. uh, and then you go to factor B, which is sales. I could just put background in there because background starts with the letter B, uh, but uh, we'll just say sales background just to remember what it is. We have two levels there, and C is, ah, guess what? C is, starts with uh, customer. Customer starts uh, with uh, C. So customers factor C, and we have two different types of customers. And so all you have to do is enter the factor names, their lows and highs. Now, in this case, you know, if we had uh, octane level, it would be 85 or a 91. You would put 85 or 91 in there. Uh -huh. uh, for uh, tire pressure, you might put 25 PSA and 35 for the high. Uh, so uh, in this case, it's pretty categorical. These factors here are categorical factors, product type. They are qualitative. They are not quantitative types of factors. I understand. So, so, Mark, I believe you want the low on customer type to be a one. Uh, thank you very much. You bet. Okay, good. So we press next. Okay. And uh, then it asks how many responses. DOE Pro will handle multiple responses. We only have one response here. It's sales. Mm -hmm. And he has 16 reps. Actually, these are sales reps. And guess what? Sales reps means replications in this case. So reps is really replication. Uh, so we put this in response. Uh, we only have one response, and we're going to call that sales. This is measured in dollars, of course. And here is your setup. So the software comes back and says, those are your eight combinations you want to test. This is your design matrix right here. It tells you that test case number one or row number or run number one is product type one with sales background one with customer type one. And uh, then, of course, you have 16 uh, different a rep. So we're going to have 16 uh, responses. Let me just go and I'm not going to take the time to put the data in because I've got this already set up. So let me go to the uh, sales data analysis here. Now I've got the data in. Those are in thousands of dollars. So when you okay, see a okay. 25 right in here, that's to the nearest thousands of dollar uh, there. So each of the Ys, Y1, Y2 represents a sales rep representative, which re represents actually in this designed experiment, a replication. So we're getting data from 16 different reps, each of the combinations here. Okay. So that's a very simple, actually this eight run design for three factors, each at two levels, Mike, is probably the most common design done out there in DOE today. Because 
you don't have a lot of test cases. You have eight test cases. You, have, you're, you can evaluate up to three factors in this guy, each at two levels, and you'll get all the interactions free of charge, clean, no confounding, no aliasing, completely independent evaluation. So that's what we have here. So uh, to do the analysis here, there's a couple of things we can do. We can go right to uh, regression analysis, and that's what we're going to do here. That is one way to analyze the data. It's the most typical way. And see, the software does the crunching here. The beauty of getting the regression analysis, say, Mark, where are you, sta where are you looking on this complex output? Yeah. I'm looking is right here. And if I see red, that means that's a significant factor or a significant ah. interaction. Red in this case means your p-value or the probability of false detection is very, very small, less than 0.05. And in, in the cases here, they're all 0. 0.0000. One minus that p-value is your level of confidence. So I can be at least 99.99% confident that product type, because I'm looking at this guy, uh, don't worry about the red up here for the constant. That's always going to be red. Okay, but okay. it's these guys right in here that are significant or not significant. Product type is sales background by itself is not significant. Customer type by itself is not significant as given by the non-red values of the p-value. This guy is significant. AB, that is the interaction of product type and sales background, is significant. The AC interaction is not significant, but the BC, and believe it or not, there's a three-way interaction, which we rarely see in, um, in um, uh, electromechanical, uh, you know, in people types of processes, we will see more higher order interactions. And we're seeing that here on this sales process, an ABC interaction. So uh, you can look at it this way. There's other diagnostics I could go into. One is this R squared. R squared just tells you of all the variation in those 16 times 8, what is that, 128 data points we saw back here on the design sheet. Of all of this data right in here, 90% of it is explained by these factors and interactions. That's what it's saying. So that's pretty good. I mean, we've used three factors to yeah. home in on, uh, or I, I should say, and their interactions to home in on what's important and what's not. So we've got some important interaction effects here, Mike. And, uh, uh, you know, another way to look at this is, uh, uh, is Pareto effects. The Pareto diagram is always a nice guy to get. Let's get it for both Y and S. Y means the average, Y hat means average, and S hat means standard deviation. We do not see anything significant here affecting the standard deviation, which is represented by S. Those coefficients in the S model were not significant, but if you look at the Y ones, there are. If you look at those four, those were the four. Those four bars represent or correspond to the four factors or interaction effects that had significant or red p-values, p-values less than 0.05. And so product type, that's your biggest. See, the beauty of the Pareto, Mike, it tells you the relative importance of these factors and interactions as well as the color coding brings back is it statistically significant? So the Pareto itself gives you a relative indication of the importance of these factors and interactions. And the, the color coding tells you then, you know, what's statistically significant and what is not. So, folks, do you have to be a mathematical wizard to figure out what's important here and what's not? I don't think so. The click of a button gave me this. The, the key thing is figuring out what are the factors and the effects. So this is very powerful stuff. Yeah, now, yeah. Uh, what we want to do is we want to get rid of, to, before we optimize or look at interaction effects, we want to get rid of the garbage in this model. This guy is garbage, AC. AC is not important. We're going to take it out of the model, all right? Uh, why? Because its p-value is big. It's not significant. Now, you say, Mark, are you going to take out C and B as well? The answer is no, and here is why. We have a little law called the law of hierarchy. I call that the parental law that says if an interaction like AB is important, you will keep the main effects A and B in the model. Mm -hmm. Okay? We could go into why that's important. You have a BC interaction here. You have an ABC interaction. So we're keeping A, B, and C, the parents of those interactions, whether they themselves or by themselves are significant or not. So this is going to be our best model here. We saw nothing significant over in the S hat model. 
this S hat over here. So we're taking all this stuff out. It, it probably wouldn't make any difference if we took it out or left it in, to be perfectly honest, because nothing's significant there anyway. So, uh, and then you uh, re regress and you get uh, the uh, what we call, as George Box would say, the most parsimonious model. By parsimonious, we, we mean the simplest model that we can get. So this Y hat model predicts the center of our distribution of the performance, which is sales, and S hat represents the standard deviation, which is pretty constant at about five, uh, and that's in thousands of dollars, so that's about $5,000 uh, standard deviation. But uh, bottom line is, uh, you know, we've got a good model. Now, let's look at the interaction plots. There's a, an analysis tool here called multiple plots that will get you all of the different uh, interactions, okay, are on this sheet, okay? And uh, where you see intersecting lines, that's where you have an interaction, okay? Just to make uh, the interpretation of this a little simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the interaction effects between product type and sales background, this guy right here, these are your main effects right down here. The, the main diagonal of this tells you, look, at product type was important. It's mm -hmm. got a steep slope. Uh, where the slopes are the steepest, that's where your most important uh, effects are coming from. Mm -hmm. So let's home in on this guy. This is the AB uh, interaction, this guy right here. Let's uh, make this uh, a lot bigger and then bring it down here so we can see it better. So we're looking at, right now, the AB interaction. There we go. Now I'm going to blow this guy up, make it a little bigger so you can see it. There, that's a, a little bigger. Yep. Yep. And uh, this is called an interaction plot between product type, which is on the horizontal axis, and sales background, which is the color-coded line. So you have two lines, a black line and a blue line. Black is for sales background one. Uh, blue is for sales background two. Now, what is this intersecting line? What is this guy telling us? Uh, it's telling us, if we look at product one, what is this best sales background? to use. Well, big, remember bigger is better. The blue option over the black is better. That sales background two for product one is your best choice. Sales background, that sales background one right there, that's a better choice than uh, sales background two for product two. So here you've got what is called an interaction plot where the effect of one factor, namely product, is influenced by the level of another factor, in this case, sales background. So sales background one is the better choice uh, for uh, product two right there. And the bigger of the two points on the, the product one is sales background two. So it's information like this, Mike, that allows the practitioner, in this case, the director of sales, to say, hey, we've got maybe an educational issue here in training. Training, uh, you know, these different sales backgrounds are coming in from two different companies, and maybe we've got to train. But for right now, we're getting the best bang for the buck, basically, by assigning sales background two to product one and sales background one to product two. This so, in is a, so in a real world example, Mark, Sales background two might have been they started off as a technical sales rep and they knew all the background of the pharmaceuticals before they became a sales rep. Uh, and so that allows them to sell product one, which is a very technical drug or or pharmaceutical stint, let's say, to doctors, whereas those salespeople that didn't come from a technical background wouldn't be able to sell those as well. Precisely. That's, that's the whole thing. It gives you information and knowledge now of what the potential causes of your increased or decreased sales are really, where are they really coming from? Right, and this right. is the nature of an interaction effect. These are, these are critical. And with one factor at a time testing, A-B testing, Mike, you aren't going to get this kind of information. Guaranteed. So what would the sales manager or director of sales do with this interaction chart, Mark? Might they say, okay, now I realize that there's an interaction and different sales people are able to sell more effectively. So I need to sp split my products up into two different sales forces rather than every salesperson selling this, the, all of the drugs. I need to tackle it differently. Exactly. That may be a partitioning of your sales force to say, for product two, we're only going to have sales background sell that guy. For product one, we're only going to have sales background two sell that guy. That's exactly right. Okay. It okay. allows you to partition, develop a strategy or a policy that will allow you to maximize your revenue. That's, that's the whole idea here.
Okay, that makes sense. So, um, back on the uh, marginal means of product type where uh, we have a very steep slope over there, Mark, and um, and it says series one on the left. It's the upper left hand graph. That's just a single factor. It says that factor, just the marginal means of product type. And that because now notice, Mike, that this guy's pretty sleep, steep, right? Right. And uh, this guy right here for sales background, not steep. It's pretty flat. That means the factors themselves are not significant. Mm. And you go back to the regression table. There's your product type that was significant. But B and C by themselves, sales background and customer type, were not significant. Uh -huh. Notice their coefficients are very small compared to product type. Product type had the biggest coefficient. And product type there is a negative slope. And that's uh, it's a negative number, the coefficient. And that is uh, reflected in the negative slope of that. I line. understand now. I understand how those are insignificant as single factors, but then the interaction is now very significant. And that makes perfect sense in a real world and statistical. Let me ask you this, Mark. The R squared is 90%. You can see it 0 0.9034. What if my expert team of sales managers didn't include the product type factor? They just forgot it and they included five other factors. What would the what would the R squared be? Might it be like twenty percent or ten percent, and that would indicate to me that like, hey, we're missing something here. Well, let's take it out. Let's take it out and see what. Uh, yeah, it would. Yeah, when your uh, your your R squared goes down, the number of times you like you take some of this stuff out. Uh, let's take these two guys out and re-regress and see what R squared does here, Mike. You know, and we can we can get that pretty easily. And uh, just do the response. Look at R squared it's down to 16%. If you don't think uh, product was a significant factor, think again, because now without it, you're down to 16%. Okay, so when I'm doing a, a modeling like this, I want to make sure that I have at least, what, 90%, 80%? What, what's the number that assures me that I've got the right factors in my model? Typically, in systems like this, like in sales, electromechanical systems, you want your R squared to be up there over 0.7. Okay, that means okay. you've, count, you've got about 70% of your variability accounted for. In uh, the psychological, in, if you're a psychiatrist and you're trying to measure or predict the performance of an individual or the behavior of an individual, if you can get an R-squared of 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and explain 40 to 50% of the variation in an individual's behavior, that's pretty doggone good. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on the application, but typically we like to look at 70% or higher. And if you don't have 90% like we have, it's an indication we haven't homed in on the right factors, exactly what you said. There are other factors out there that it can explain this variation that we are not able to explain right now. Yeah. Mark, this seems pretty uh, A to Z roadmappy. I understand it. I, I found my, I know, you know, I got my experts to tell me the factors. I defined the, the two different values. Um, uh, and uh, put it into the system. Your your software told me what to go collect data on. Um, it ran the numbers. I know what R squared I look for. I can tell what the p-value is for the factors, what to eliminate, and then how to look at the interaction so that I can figure out how to change my business, how to set up my sales force so they're more effective. And then I can measure the revenue coming out after doing what my model said to do. My question, the only question I have is around data collection. In this pr particular example, where we ran the different 16 replications, do I need to then go into salesforce.com and quantify all the deals we just won and then bucketize them into product type, sales background, and, and customer type in order to gather this data? Do I sort of do it retroactively? Mike, you can always add new data coming in from your new process to this data and upgrade your model. That's exactly what the folks at Boston Fleet Bank did in their HR. They continued. They didn't cut. They they cut their uh, you know uh, turnover rate down from fifty percent down to about fifteen percent. But they still had people occasionally leaving the company. Mm -hmm. They would still get that new data. They'd wrap that back in and uh, and use that to build a new model or an updated model. We do the same thing here. As we change our policies and we say, okay, uh, if you got background two, you guys are gonna target product number one and back sales background one, you're gonna target product number two, like we saw in that interaction plot. And now you add that data to this data, the sales data, 
Uh, it becomes more of a historical data analysis. It's not a pure DOE, but you can still update your basic model that you used with the original data. Okay. And these are likely manual processes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, pretty much manual. And, uh, you know, you'd want somebody who's familiar with the software to put the data in and upgrade, update the model with the new data. All right. Fantastic example, Mark. I completely understand how this works, and I know how I would take the data and then analyze it and make changes to my business. Let's um, let's go into example two. What example do you have um, from the medical industry? Okay, this one is something that uh, affects us all, and that's blood testing, blood mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all go in sooner or later to have blood tests done, and you got to wonder if. Uh, uh, the results that come back are accurate. Are they are, are they uh, false positives, false negatives? If we go in, and uh, this company, uh, uh, this comes from uh, Abbott Laboratories and Dynaboat, their Japanese affiliate. Uh, so uh, this came, uh, and and now you can see here they're interested. Uh, their experts say, well, they've got a response. It's called a signal, uh, and this is a a signal that they're targeting for 1,620, okay? They have a machine in this blood test that uh, records the target uh, or the value of the signal. Their target is 1,620, and their uh, specs, they have specs. Now, what are the specs? The 1,570 to the 1,670. On this normal distribution at the bottom of the page, you will see the specs. Whoops, I don't want that one. I want this one right here. The specs are right here, Mike, where the red starts on the left and where the red starts on the right. Yeah. Those yeah. are the specs at 1570 and 1670. So you can see that you got a lot of red. You got a lot of out of spec, possible false positives, false negatives coming out of this test. That would not hack it, okay? Yeah, that's not good. Your DPM, your defects per million is 571,000. Basically, half the tests they're running are out of specification. Yeah. You got 57% defect rate, and you can look yeah. at the other stats there, but that's the one I concentrate on, is 57% of the area under the curve is red. That is not good. They're not going to sell anything, if uh, any of their blood tests, if this is, uh, you know, drug testing, they may be vying for uh, the Major League Baseball contract. You think they'll be able to compete? For, forget it. They may not be able to complete on this drug testing, uh, you know, uh, uh, contract. So they get down into the business of saying, okay, what are our factors? Now, if you're a subject matter expert, that's where we need you. We need you to understand what are the factors that could impact that signal. Well, they came up with seven. Substrate type, pH, reagent concentration, you can see them there on the left. Mm -hmm. Those are the factors. They wanted to do a screening design. Now, when you do seven factors, unlike the three we did in the sales example, or the director of sales did, uh, you know, two to the three is eight, eight possible combinations. If you did that for seven, two to the seventh would be 128 possible combinations. Way too expensive. Yeah, Takes yeah. too long. So what we're going to do, uh, a general rule of thumb is, is that if you have six or more factors, you probably want to screen first before you model. Mm -hmm. So screening is the first thing we'll do here. And we can do that with a very simple 12 run design, which is called an L12 design. It happens to be a Taguchi 12 run design, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. Let's see where's our 12 run screening design. I'm going to, uh, uh, Mike, uh, eliminate putting in the data. I'm going to tell you the data that they already have. Okay. Here is the 12 run design, which is an excellent design for testing up to 11. You have the ability to test up to 11 factors mm -hmm. in a 12 run design. There are really 11 columns, but we only have, we're only showing seven because they only want to test seven factors. Okay. So okay. they're doing 12 test cases. Each of those 12 test cases looks like this. So if you tick test case two, you're using substrate type one with a four and a half pH, reagent concentration at 2%, mixing time is one minute, uh, incubation time is also one, the incubation temperature is 120 degrees, and the blood temperature is 100. So that is the combination, and now they did four replications. That is the number of reps, Mike, to have a significant, that is a 95% confidence level in your result. Mm -hmm. uh, so the number of replications, we had 16 before, uh, because the, the director of sales had, he had the number of sales reps available to do it. Well, in this test, you got to be efficient, uh, but you still have to be effective, 
And so the number of replications is going to depend on the number of test cases. So we have 12 test cases and we have rules. Uh, software will come up with this automatically and say, you should be doing four replications. So that's what they did here to have 95% confidence in their results for both Y and for S, for standard deviation. So this is called a 12-run screening design, and its purpose in life is to screen out the main effects. In screening, you are not interested in interactions. Interactions come from modeling designs. Mm -hmm. This is a screening design. So a very simple, and you mentioned it in the last example, a very simple analysis technique, Mike, is the marginal means plot. You can get that from the raw data. Let's get it from both Y hat and S hat for the factors that affect standard deviation and the factors that affect the mean. Now, this is a marginal means plot where all of the marginal means are on the same graph right now, Mike. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, do you have to be a mathematical wizard to figure <laughs> out where the longest lines are? You don't, have to, you don't have to be a math genius to figure out which one's different from the rest. Exactly right. It's number one. It's way over here. It's this guy here. And you know what that happens to be? A qualitative variable called substrate. Mm -hmm. Substrate type. These are two different substrates. They're coming from two different vendors. So which is the better vendor? Which is the better substrate? Mm -hmm. It's this guy because in standard deviation, smaller is always better. Smaller is better. So smaller dots are better. Mm -hmm. The stuff here, this guy's going to, when we, when we get the, uh, when we get the, the regression results, this guy's going to have a significant p-value, but relatively speaking, it's not nearly as important as the uh, the first factor there, which is substrate type. The other guys, they're just probably just noise in there. Uh, you know, there's there's no substance there at all. Now, when you look at the y, that's for s. Now, that's that's gold. When you discover a factor that shifts your standard deviation, Mike, that's like finding gold. Yeah, so that may be that may explain all of the variability of your process right there. Exactly right. Okay. And right. turns out that it will, but we'll get validation of that in the modeling design. Okay. okay. Uh, so here's your why. Now this one is not so clear cut. Mm -hmm. You, but again, you still don't have to be a mathematical wizard or a rocket scientist to figure what your top three are. That's number one there, and that's your uh, that's the third guy. That's your reagent concentration. Number two is your pH, and number three hitter as far as uh, length of line segments is your incubation time. Okay. So those three factors are the guys that will affect the center uh, or the mean of your output distribution. And uh, the other guys, the S's here, will uh, that guy's a big hitter. You've got to control that guy at the setting where you get the smallest standard deviation. That's, that's the bottom line. Now, we can also do, from the design sheet, we can get the regression analysis and... Uh, uh, we just go in and do the analysis, not the marginal means this time, but get the regression, and you're going to start seeing red and non-red here. And uh, you can see over here for the S, the two guys that are red are substrate type and incubation temp. Those were the two longest lines on the S marginal means plot. Mm -hmm. You can see, relatively speaking, 31 is a lot bigger than 8. Mm -hmm. But they are both statistically significant, so we got to keep that in mind as well. Not only relatively speaking, but statistically speaking. Over here, this guy's not important, but the three big hitters are pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time. Mm -hmm. So the screening allows us to understand what are the most important factors. Notice the screening design does not give us information on interactions. To get information on interactions, we have to use a modeling design. And that's what we did next, Mike. We went in, picked those top three factors out, and we did a design. Now, this should look familiar to the, to the listener. Uh, that's an eight-run design, just like we did with the, uh, uh, with the good old sales data. Yep. The sales yep. data was an eight-run full factorial for three factors at two levels, and that's what, exactly what we have here. Three factors, each at two levels. Two times two times two, yep. eight yep. possible combinations. The number of reps here was five. Remember in the sales, he had he had enough reps to do 16 reps. We're only going to do five reps, but five reps is enough here. Replications is enough to, to give us uh, the ability to get at least 95% confidence in our resulting models. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the design. We can now do the, uh, the um, analysis on this guy. We can do the uh, analyze the design, and now from the design, the modeling design, we get uh, this guy right here. Now, what do we know? And, and while we were doing this design, the substrate type and the incubation temperature were held constant at their 
their pre prescribed or their best settings. Mm -hmm. So when we were doing this experiment, the two guys that we found significant in the S-hat model, primarily substrate, had to be held constant during this experiment. Now, what do we know now that we didn't know before? Well, we knew before that pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time were important. They're still important. The modeling design tells you they're important. So this design actually validates what we saw in the screening design for the main effects, and it also discovers one other interaction effect, the interaction effect between A and B, which is pH and reagent concentration. That's a very strong interaction. These other three guys, this is also knowledge. They are not important. The ACC and the ABC, the three-way interaction, are not important. So we found information about the interaction effects. Notice how your R-squared bumped up now. We've yeah. got no yeah. over 99%. Gosh, I'll take that any day of the week. <laughs> we can get 99% uh, R-squared. Uh, so over here, uh, nothing is significant. We can go to the marginal means to see that, relatively speaking. So if we go up here and get the marginal means of the um, Pareto... Uh, or the Pareto effect. We can get the Pareto of both Y hat and S hat. And uh, you don't see anything significant for the S hat, but for Y, you're going to see not only the reagent concentration, pH, and incubation time in the same order, relative order as they were from the screening design, mm -hmm. but now you've got this initial uh, additional information on the AB interaction, and the other guys are just insignificant. Okay? So basically, we've got that. So we've got a good regression model but we've got to take the garbage out of here. So when we optimize, we're going to optimize. We've got to find the settings for pH reagent concentration and incubation time that will get us to our target. So we're going to take garbage out. That is the insignificant terms over there. Nothing's important over here. So we're going to take these guys out as well. Uh, they don't uh, tell us too much. Uh, and uh, there's no significance there. And we're going to regress again. I'm just going to go in and get the uh, parsimonious model. There it is. And now it's going to be on this model that we're going to optimize. We're going to use this model to find the critical settings that we need to hit a target of 1620. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to do that, we go to graphs and optimization. We'll use the optimizer here. And we don't have multiple responses. We only have one. Now, the software is now asking me to specify the low and high settings of each of the factors on which we want to allow the software to search for the optimal solution. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not going to go outside the range that we did when we did the DOE, which this is the low and the highs of the DOE that we did. And going outside would be what we call extrapolation, which can be a bit hazardous if you extrapolate too far. So we're just going to leave the lows and highs here and allow the software to search in that three space, where is the best combination, can we hit 1620? We say, okay, and we're going to just do a very simple optimization here of, say, get my Y to 1620 and add that constraint, and now we optimize, and here are your results right down here. The results say, you want to hit 1620, put your pH at 7.4, your agent concentration at 5, and your incubation time at 4.96. We will copy these settings to the worksheet, and the, the software just copied them into our predictor, and now our prediction under these settings, these experimental settings, our prediction is a target of 1620. We should hit 1619.96, which rounded to 1620. Your standard deviation will be that, and here's your 99% confidence or risk bounds. So 99% of the time, your, uh, your results should go between 1514 and 1725, hitting a target there. So we know with three factors, pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time, we know we can put our response variable right on the target. And here are the combination of the settings that will do that. Notice that they're all three of them are up towards the high end of the space or the range in which pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time were tested. Uh, it's up there close to seven and a half for pH, close to five, exactly five for reagent concentration, close to five for incubation time. Uh, so uh, that's what it is, okay? That will produce, let me show you if we went in and uh, told you what it will be from a prediction point of view. Uh, the graph, I have that already, already in uh, this scenario right here. This is what your new scenario would be at the bottom. After the DOE, at those optimal settings, Mike, you will get uh, the CPK or a prediction of 
Now, it's still not the greatest. Yeah, it, you know, I, I would have thought uh, based on the DOE and this analysis that we did that, you know, it would have six standard deviations in there. It'd be a six sigma process where you only have a few defects per million opportunities, but it's still showing 154,000 defects per million tests run. That's right. You're down to a 15% defect rate. Up here, it was 57%. Down here, the proportion that is red is 15%. Still not good enough. One DOE that is concentrating on three factors with, with one factor, mainly the uh, substrate type being the variance reduction factor. But the bottom, t the bottom uh, graph, Mike, shows you that we are right on target. The process is centered between the specs where it's yeah. not up above. Now right. what's, our, what's our objective now? We've got to remove more standard deviation. Right. We've right. got to make that curve taller and narrower. We have demonstrated with three factors, namely pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time, that we can put, put this process on target, but we've got to reduce the variation. Now, substrate type, where do we go for this? Well, we go back to our fishbone diagram or wherever we are to what are some of the other factors mm -hmm. that impact standard deviation. And we've got to search those guys out. We've got to test those. We already have a hint. One of the hints... I don't know if you remember, was substrate type. Right, right. Now we can go into our vendor, work with our vendor on that substrate type, probably do a DOE at the vendor's facility to find out how we can improve that substrate even more than what it is doing now. We know, we know whatever is in that substrate type is causing variance reduction. Can we exacerbate those particular factors and get more information? That may, and this is very typical of DOE, one DOE mic is going to lead to another. Yeah. Hey, Mark, can we can we have just said um, it looks like substrate type two is better than substrate type one? Let's do a DOE with only substrate type two and these different factors and see if it reduces the standard deviation. And then if it does, then whoever's supplying substrate type one, they need to go solve their own problem. That's not our issue. We fixed our process. Second DOE, Mike, was done with substrate type 2 held constant at the better setting. Okay. So okay. we did not find any other factors that reduce variation. So we're still hurting for the factors that are reducing variation. We still have to search those guys out. And actually, they did, they did more screening designs uh, and found uh, variance shifting factors as well. But one of the, the things was... That substrate, substrate vendor, type 2, which we were getting small standard deviations, going back to them and saying, okay, what are the major ingredients of this substrate? What can we go and find out uh, as to what might uh, you know, change our standard deviation even further, make right. it even less? So they worked with that vendor, but they found some other factors as well that reduced the standard deviation even further. So, uh, Excellent. you know, that Excellent. They, so they not only had it centered on the process, but then they reduced the standard deviation by going to the vendor and helping them do uh, analyze the factors that might affect their output of their process. Exactly. Right. So the, output, the output of their process is an input to these guys' process. Right. That's exactly. exactly and that's where you get this cascading effect of the propagation of error, the propagation of variability, where the variation coming out of one process is input to the, uh, to the next process. And that's where going back earlier into the life cycle, that is, of the process, getting back to that vendor of substrate and finding out we got to make this guy better. We already know that there's something in your substrate that is making the variation low. Mm -hmm. Can we take advantage of that further? And they did that. Excellent. All right, great example, Mark. I've got um, just a final um, couple wrap-up questions. You know, people are now exposed to the power of design of experiments. Um, it, you know, maybe I want to apply it to i6sigma.com, which, you know, I'm part, as a Six Sigma practitioner and, and I've worked at GE and Citigroup doing uh, Six Sigma in the past. I'm a little embarrassed to say that I haven't really applied it to i6sigma.com. Maybe I want to go figure out how to convert more people who visit our marketplace to sell them more project examples or our research that we've done. Or maybe I want to convert more visitors to uh, newsletter subscribers. What are my options to learn more and take the next step? 
Well, you know, as you say, Mike, there's got to be a next step. I would, I would recommend uh, education. What I've shown you today is just, uh, you know, a, a couple of examples. One, for, like you said, from the service or the transactional area in sales. Another from uh, the more scientific area of blood analysis. But um, there's a lot of things that go into this, like randomization, like uh, replications. You know, I said we got to use five reps on this eight-run design. Where'd that come from? I, I mean, how many replications do we have to do with a 16-run design, right, with a 32-run right. design? And what if I want to screen 55 factors? Uh, you know, a little bit of education helps. We have books out there. We have uh, three books. The one that you showed mm -hmm. at the beginning of our session, the DFSS, the Tool Guide for Practitioners, the one we, we did, uh, uh, you know, working with you guys. Yep. Uh, that is the best book as far as learning how to use the software because – each of the software steps, what I showed you here today, is described in great detail in the DOE section of that book. That's so right. if you want to link software to the application, that is the best book to have. We have a couple other books, uh, the Basic Stats book that we have and the Understanding Industrial Design Experiments book. They both have a lot of case studies, like the UIDE, the DOE book, has the AIDS case study in it that I mentioned before. Uh, they have a lot of case studies that people can, uh, not only the methodology of DOE, like when you have eight factors, what should you be testing? When you have eight factors at three levels, what design should you be using? Now, you can allow the software to pick the design for you, which it will, but uh, you would want some underlying understanding of why it's picking that design rather than some other design. So uh, we have the books, Mike. We have our website. I'd encourage anybody to go out and see some of these uh, case studies that are on our website. Many of them are DOE related. Some are not. Some are, uh, you know, success stories without DOE. Sure, uh, sure. But, but DOE is critical. Of all the tools, the methods, Mike, that we have seen in Lean Six Sigma and Design for Six Sigma over the years, DOE brings the greatest return on investment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's that's kind of the point I'd like to make. We have the books, we have the software, we, we entirely recommend that you use a KISS approach, keep it simple statistically, use a software package that you can put down for two, three months, pick it up without missing a beat. You need something simple to start with. Yeah. And uh, uh, I would just say, you know, from a business perspective, look at what your critical performance measures are and then start looking at the factors that impact those. And I'll bet money right now you may be already collecting data on some of those factors. If not, set up a DOE and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, do the replicates and get involved in analyzing uh, the results to find those critical factors. All right, Mark, if people want to buy the basic stats book or buy the design for Six Sigma book, not that, you know, they have to, but I want to provide... Um, the resources to people that want to take the next step and want to learn more, they can do that on your website. And what is that URL? Uh, www.aracad.com. So it's just aracad, A-I-R-A-C-A-D.com. Great. And then they can click on products. Now, the software that we're using, uh, that you use in the example, looked very easy to use. It, um, it, it was Excel-based, I noticed. It was probably a plug-in or an add-on. Um, it's called DOE Pro. Is that correct? It's correct. DOE Pro. It is a Microsoft Excel add-in, and it is extremely easy to use. And it uh, uses our rules of thumb to select the design for you, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's extremely easy to Are use. you the developer of that software, Mark, your, your company? Air Academy Associates and Sigma Zone are the co-developers of this software. Okay. And, okay. So, uh, and they can go to airacad.com in order to purchase that software as well? That's right. They can okay. go there. Okay. They can go to uh, that website and then look on software and that'll take you to our Six Sigma products group is where you would order the software from. But Okay. Now, here's my question, Mark. I have a, an attorney that handles my intellectual property issues. You know, if I want to file a trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, I will go to my attorney and I will pay him, you know, 300 bucks an hour to to handle that and do it right because I know he's an expert on that. Does it make sense for me if I want to optimize my sales process to hire an expert like yourself or somebody that's an expert in design of experiments for four hours to help me, you know, set up the experiment, identify the factors, tell me what data to go collect, and then I go collect the data and then bring it back and we analyze it together and 
so I make sure that I'm not like screwing up looking at a Y hat when it should have been a R hat or whatever, you know. Does that make sense to do? Yep. Oh, we do that all the time. We, we're doing it with one company who's got a problem with uh, one of their products and a, they've got millions of dollars in, of inventory sitting there waiting to be sold, but they've got a problem they've got to resolve with their customer first. So we're in there uh, trying to design an experiment right now that will get to root cause. And uh, we've got to find the cause of that. And we'll set them up. They'll run the test. And then we'll, they'll bring us back in or call us to do help them with the analysis. We will do that. But we recommend that DOE does not have to be that hard, that you develop an expertise within your own company over time so you can uh, do the fishing, so to speak, yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we don't have to do that for you. And DOE does not have to be that complicated. Like I said, you can develop practitioners uh, through a little bit of training uh, to uh, to develop that capability internally. Now, you, will you ever, you know, even if you're a practitioner of DOE, which I am, uh, I still have to go to the doc. Uh, you know, the over over the counter statistics sometimes is not going to do it. When I do a DOE and I, it's a critical guy, very expensive, two hundred thousand bucks a shot. I'm going to get. Uh, I'm going to get somebody else to look at that design uh, to say, is there something I'm missing? Have we missed anything here in the planning stage of this design that I should be considering that I'm not considering right now? Sure. So you always need a lifeline. Everybody needs a lifeline. And uh, we can provide that lifeline without training or we can provide that lifeline with training to uh, reduce the dependency on the lifelines. Okay, so I can I can go to ericad.com and I can use the contact form and say I need coaching or mentoring for doing design of experiments in my own company and I can hire you guys on an hourly basis to do that. Absolutely. But I can also I, I can also sign up for open enrollment training it sounds like you have through uh, you know looking at your calendar on your website or I, I believe that we have them on our events calendar on i6sigma.com as well the listing of your courses you do offer a one week course on design of experiments where you can teach people how to fish themselves so they you don't have to give them the fish they're not paying you for the fish you're teaching them how to uh, how to do this this use this tool themselves Absolutely. We, we think it takes about five days uh, to uh, show them not only the two level designs we talked about, but three level, then also mixed level. Talk about historical data analysis from a DOE context. It takes about five days to get them up to be a, a, a practitioner. And uh, that's about what it is in our Lean Six Sigma and, and uh, DFSS uh, curricula too. It's about a week long class, mm -hmm. really just focusing on design of experiments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because one DOE mic can save the cost of, you cannot believe, of all of the waste that uh, yeah, yeah. is uh, generated by a particular process. Uh, just finding an interaction effect is, uh, or a factor that reduces variation. Uh, at GE Corporate R&D, I know you, didn't, you worked at GE, but not at, maybe in Corporate R&D, when they saw these screening designs, like that 12-run design, those PhD chemists said, hey, man, I didn't realize we could test that many factors looking for these factors that shift the standard deviation. Yeah, you can do it, and you can do it quite um, uh, quite effectively and efficiently with a few number of runs. It doesn't yeah. take that many test cases. Yeah, all right. And so regardless of how people learn, if they already have a background in statistics and they watch us run through these examples and they want to pay – uh, you know, forty dollars or whatever it is for the book to to have an example to go through. They can buy the software. They can maybe buy the book, and they can go off and do it for people that need a little bit more assistance. They can hire you a consultant for people that want to learn how to fish themselves. They can go to a, a five day training course and learn all the tools and the and the and full educational background themselves. So we're offering a whole different variety of options. We're not saying that any one is correct for anybody watching this show. But if people have a follow-up question, um, you can go ahead and post it in the comments below the video, and we'll ask Mark to come back and answer as many as he can. Um, Air Academy Associates is on Twitter, of course. Their Twitter handle is Air Academy Associates. It's uh, A-I-R-A-C-E-D-E-M-Y-A-S-S-O-C. -S -S I'll have a link to their Twitter account just below the video as well. Mark, if someone wants to contact you directly to ask a question, maybe they're too embarrassed to ask it in a comment or they just want to reach out to you, how can they do that? Is there a preferred email address? Uh, email address, you can send it to AAA, that's AAA at ericad.com. That's the email address, and that'll get to one of our DOE practitioners if I'm not there. Uh, so 
AAA at ericad.com, okay. or they could call us at 719-531-0777. That's 719-531-0777. Great, and we'll have that in the transcript below as well. I'm going to urge the audience right now, if you receive value out of this interview, please take a moment to say thank you to Mark. This is as easy as posting a comment below the show. Um, following Air Academy on Twitter, sending a tweet out saying, thanks, Mark, and there'll be a link just below the video saying, I got a lot of value out of this. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues. Um, you know, Mark's taken uh, a, an hour, a couple hours plus in preparation out of his time uh, to to give back to the community, and I think that he's given enough to get a lot of people moving in the right direction so that they're not wasting time and money in their business, that they're optimizing their processes. So thank you, Mark, for doing that. Dr. Mark Kimley, president and co-founder of Air Academy Associates, thank you from i Sigma for coming on the show, sharing your knowledge of optimization and design of experiments and helping others become successful change agents and business leaders. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>